In the color page of Resolve, you make adjustments to your image using notes. Whatever change you want to make is applied within this little box, and then it carries that information along to the next box, and the next one after that, creating a pipeline of information, flowing from one to the next. And if you change the order of these little boxes, you get a different result. So you develop a method of working with this flow to achieve your desired result. But what if I told you that's only one piece of the puzzle? This pipeline doesn't only extend beyond the color page, but there are even multiple pipelines that run parallel to your node workflow. Well, my name's Nathan, and today I'll be your tour guide in navigating the DaVinci Resolve image processing pipeline, starting with the decode process all the way to the final render on the delivery page, giving you the knowledge you need to bring your color grading workflow to the next level. So here we are in DaVinci Resolve 17, and to help demonstrate the Resolve pipeline and how things work and where they all go, we're going to be using this edited music video, which is the song Take Me Away by the artist Problematic. And starting off at the very beginning, the first thing that image processing is going to do is it's going to look at your raw metadata. That is, of course, only if you shot it in raw. If not, you can skip this step. But to check it out, we're going to go into our project settings. We're then going to come down to our camera raw tab here, and by default, we're set up with a raw profile of Airy Alexa. Now for this project, I actually use Blackmagic Raw, so we're going to check that out. And we have a few options. We can choose our decode quality, so you can decrease that if you need things to be a little bit easier on your machine, but I like to look at things in the full resolution. We can also choose what we're decoding using. So you can choose to use your camera metadata, which is the data that you used on the camera on the day of actually recording. You can choose Blackmagic Raw default, or you can choose project settings, which allows you to easily make adjustments to all the Blackmagic RAW clips. And right from the beginning, it gives you the ability to change your color science, white balance, your color space that you want to start off with, and even your gamma. And you can also, let's say you want to enable highlight recovery for all your clips, you can do that right in here. And it's the first thing that happens in the pipeline. But if we come out of our project settings and we go into the color page, we also have control on that on the clip specific level. If let's say we want to make adjustments to this clip, maybe we want to bump up the ISO. Well, we can do that and it doesn't affect the other clips in the timeline. So we can just change that back. So moving on from camera raw, we're going to move into color management, which is the second thing that happens in the resolve processing pipeline. We're going to go into our project settings and we're going to go into color management. Now for this project, I used DaVinci YRGB Color Managed, but you have a few options. Now, by default, you're set up for DaVinci YRGB, which is not a color managed workflow. In this workflow, you just set your timeline color space, whatever color space you want to work within, and you can go from there. And you have a couple controls, but a color managed workflow is a little bit different. Now, you do have a few options. We can choose between DaVinci YRGB Color Managed, like I'm using in this project, and we can also choose ACES. And you have a couple options for ACES with ACES CC and ACES CCT, the main difference being how they handle shadows just a little bit differently from each other. But whether you're using ACES or DaVinci YRGB color managed workflow, the general concept is relatively the same. So with ACES, the image is processed using the ACES input device transform, which transforms your color space into the ACES color space, which is essentially a very large color space. You select the particular settings for the camera and the shot that you're using from this list, and then you work within that color space in your color tab to grade the image to your liking. And when you output the image, you're using the ACES output device transform, which you then get to choose what color space you want to output your final image to. And that's the simplest way that I can explain it, but it's kind of a deep rabbit hole. And if you want to learn more, there's more info down in the description. But we're going to compare that to DaVinci YRGB Color Managed, and you'll definitely see some similarities. So in a DaVinci Color Managed workflow, a color space transform is applied to the image, but DaVinci analyzes the clip's metadata, and it automatically applies a color space transform to get it to your desired color space. Now, in this situation, you get to choose which color space you want to work in. If you want to work in something small, you have access to a Rec. 709 color space, or if you want to work in something large, you do have the DaVinci wide gamut and everything else in between. So you do all your color grading in your chosen color space, 
And then when you want to output your final product, which we'll touch on at the end, you can choose your output color space and it's whatever you want to deliver to. And with both the DaVinci Color Managed and an Asus workflow, you actually have the ability to choose what input color space you're using per a specific clip. So we can right click on the clip, select our input color space, and then we get all sorts of choices, but automatically it chose Blackmagic Design Film Gen 1. And if it's not right, you can change it or you can change it to anything you want or bypass it entirely if you like. And now we move on to our input LUT. So we're going to go into our project settings. So we go over to our lookup tables or our LUTs and we can choose an input lookup table. Now this is a great place for a utility LUT. So something that can convert us to a specific color space, kind of similar to what we were doing in a color managed workflow. However, you have a specific LUT to choose from. Now you can select from anything in the list and you can also even use your own LUTs if you would like, which is great for a fast workflow if you have a specific LUT in mind that you wanna use. And then obviously you also have your output lookup table. So if you have a specific look that you wanna to apply to your image, not just a utility LUT, this is where I would recommend applying this if you wanna work in a specifically a LUT designed workflow and you wanna apply the same LUT to all the images, this is a good way to do that. But you don't need to apply the LUT globally. You can also cancel out of this and apply the LUT to an individual image. If we go into our LUTs, you then get all sorts of choices here. And that's gonna be the third thing that happens in your image processing pipeline. And if you want, you can select multiple clips and adjust your input color space or your LUT if you want to. And next in the pipeline is where Fusion fits into everything. So if we turn off our grade for a minute here, we can see we have this look. This is what it looks like just with Resolve Color Management, just bring us into the Rec 709 color space. So if we disable that, this is what our grade looks. However, going into Fusion, we can see clearly that the grade is not applied, but it's also not a log image. So this means that Fusion takes place after Resolve Color Management, but before any of the nodes in the color page. And now we'll cover the image processing that happens within your nodes on your color page of DaVinci Resolve. But first we need to quickly talk about groups. Now, if you see this shot actually has this little green chain underneath it, as well as these three other shots. Now that means they are in a group together. Well, what exactly does that mean? Well, if we go over to this clip here, we'll notice up here that we actually have two node graphs to choose from. We have our clip specific node graph and we also have our timeline node graph. But if we go over to our grouped clips, we have more graphs to choose from, which we can also see in a drop down list here. Now, these actually work in order. We have our group pre clip. And what this means is anything that happens in this node graph is going to affect everything else in the group. So let's say we're going to bring the gamma way down that then happens to every other shot in the group. And then we have our clip specific node graph, which only affects the specific clip in that group. So we can adjust our gamma all the way down, but you see on our other shots, we do not see that change. And now go over to the group post clip. Now this also impacts all of the shots in the group. So we can bring our gamma way the math down and you can see that change is being applied to all of the other shots. So we can revert that there. Now you may be wondering to yourself, okay, well the group post and pre-clip do the same things, right? Yes and no. That's where we get into talking about our processing pipeline. So as you can imagine, the first thing that actually happens is in your group pre-clip. And then your clip is what happens second. And then your group post clip are things that happen after that. And with the final dot, you can see our timeline no graph, which we will get into later. But as you can imagine, it's the very last thing in your node graphs. So starting off with our group pre clip, we know that that happens first. But what type of things would you like to do in your group pre clip or at the very beginning of your clip node graph if you're not working within groups? So a simple rule of thumb I have for myself is anything within the motion effects tab, I want to happen at the very beginning of my node graph. And the reason that you want to do this is you want to be working with as close to the source image as you can with these effects. So it almost replicates that change happening in camera or very close to it so that you don't end up with any sort of funkiness if you do sharpening beforehand and then you try and 
do noise reduction on your sharpening or something like that. It's just you want to avoid those issues. And we're going to come into our clip specific node tree. As the name implies, it's a clip specific node graph. It only applies to this one clip. So any changes that you made in here are applied to this specific clip. Now in a group workflow, a good way to use this is let's say we find that this shot here is great. We like the exposure of her face and where it's sitting. But in this shot, it's a little too dark on the side of his face. So maybe we want to increase the shadow a little bit so they kind of feel like they're in the same space. Any type of tonal color or exposure control is great to do in the clip page, especially if you're not working within a group workflow, then you basically want to do everything in here. And I recommend starting off with balancing your clip, then getting the exposure that you want, and then getting him maybe some more creative choices. But one of the great things about Resolve is that it lets you work the way that you want to work. So let's say we create a specific look in here. Yeah, sure, something like that. And we're not quite sure we want to stick with it, but we want to hold on to it for later. Now we could take a still of this shot. And then with that still, we actually have the node graph and we can apply that to any shot later if we want to hold on to that. But there's an easier way we can even work within that. We can create a new version with control Y and now we have a different color grading version. So now we can switch between the two versions and let's say we make a change. We don't like that look. Maybe we want to go even darker with it. And you can go back and forth by hitting Control B on your keyboard between your different versions, and you can check them out here and load them or rename them or disable them if you want. And those things are happening at the exact same time in your image processing pipeline. But it even goes one step deeper. There's something else that also is happening at the same time parallel to this clip node tree and these different versions that are going on. If we right click on our clip, and then we go up, we see use local grades, use remote grades. Now you may not have seen this before, or know exactly what this is, but the entire time you've used Resolve, you've been using local grades. So with your local grades, they're applied to a clip specific level and a clip is a segment of a shot. However, with your remote grades, that looks at the shot as a whole and you can then make changes to everything else in the shot. And now any changes that we make to this clip no graph actually affects everything else that's part of the original shot. So we can make changes here and now you see them happening across the board. But if we go back to using local grades, boom, and now everything goes back to normal and all of those things are happening at exactly the same time. And now we can just kind of get rid of these changes here. Maybe we'll keep this shadow change. Now moving on to the group post clip, which if you're not working in groups is just the end of your clip specific node tree. You'll want to do things like maybe soft clipping on the high and low end here. As you see, we kind of flatten everything out, helping with the roll off. Basically just things you want to globally affect the image at the very end of your pipeline. So maybe that could be sharpening in this case, you know, make things a little bit sharper or it could even be balancing out your shadows. Now moving on, you'd think we'd move to the timeline node tree, but not quite. We're going to go back to our edit page. So we go into our effects library and we come down to effects. We then grab our adjustment clip and drag that over top, make it a little bit larger here. And now any adjustment that we make on this clip affects anything underneath it. So we can go into the color page and let's just say, for example, we'll make everything darker. Now, everything underneath that clip is now going to get darker. And it does this in the processing pipeline after even the group post clip. And a really useful way to use this is if we go into our effects and maybe we want to add film grain to certain segments of the piece, then we can do that. And then we can have certain scenes have extra levels of film grain and we can have control over it. And we are doing that at the end of our process, which is where you definitely want to add effects like film grain or analog film damage, something like that. But what if you want to affect everything on the timeline uniformly? Well, then that's when you go into your timeline node graph and everything on the timeline is being impacted at the very end. So we can make it darker and it does so after every other effect. And after that, we're left with our output LUT, just as I had described earlier. And also our output color space if we're working with DaVinci YRGB color managed or if we're in ACES, it's our output device transform. And that also ties into our video monitor lookup table if we want a specific LUT applied to our display. 
And after that, if we save our changes, it comes down to the delivery page and it's however you want to deliver your final file. So that's the entire pipeline from beginning to end inside of DaVinci Resolve.